Greetings, Eddie. Everything okay? Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. The next interview is Eddie Adeyemi, um, the chief executive of Echo Bank, based in Lome, Togo. Uh, it is a pioneering pan-African financial institution that has gone from uh, strength to strength over the years. And Ade um, has had a particularly successful period, and we've, we've met on several occasions. Um, so the story of the bank is one thing, and the story of the wider world is another. And right now, where we're facing, um, as Mo alluded uh, to, we're facing uh, a pretty brutal uh, economic environment. Uh, Countries that were on the brink of recovering from the pandemic at the end of last year were, towards the end of February, hit by the repercussions of, uh, of the conflict in Ukraine, uh, triggered by Moscow's invasion, which has uh, ramped up the price of food and fuel, particularly fertilizers and wheat, uh, across the world, but it's, it's affected African economies. But it also has to be set against a broader trend uh, as, as Western economies uh, started ending the era of uh, cheap money and low interest rates. And higher interest rates, led by the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England, are again uh, having a shadowing effect uh, across economies across the world. Um, and the Financial Times, a couple of weeks ago, quoted the latest uh, estimates that over $40 billion has, have left the emerging markets, which obviously includes large parts of Africa, uh, for what they would uh, regard as the more secure markets, and certainly in the now higher yielding markets in, in, in the West. And that, that's having an effect right across the world, and it's having an effect very much on, on the operations of the, the fi financial sector um, in, in Africa. So I wondered if we could start, Ade, by, um, by looking at how your, your bank um, has adapted to, uh, to these shifting economic signs. I know the last time we spoke, you were talking about adapting to the pandemic, which at the time seemed to be, uh, seemed to be quite successful, the adaptation strategy. Uh, what about the latest twists and turns? How, how has Echobank been uh, adapting to those? Uh, th thank you very much, and thanks to uh, everybody who have been here, uh, especially when we're discussing uh, the continent of Africa. I'm delighted that all of you have set your time to, uh, here uh, to try and listen to, to the conversation. The second thing I will say is that the question of the, the pandemic is uh, everywhere in the world, so it's global. We can't uh, blame ourselves for that. And the issue of inflation as a result of food uh, prices also is global. We need to be better prepared yeah. as we face the future, because the past, there's nothing you can do about it. The war is the war is happening. The pandemic has happened. We don't have to sit here to discuss why, why the war is there. But we've missed opportunity historically to be able to allocate our resources properly for the purpose of being able to feed ourselves. Mm. If we talk about Africa being a youthful population, uh, Strive said uh, median age is 19 years old. Somebody said 60% uh, is 25 years old, which means we have enough resources in terms of people to be able to generate enough food production to feed ourselves. Somebody says 60% of our arable land is uncultivated, which means we have those land resources to be able to feed ourselves. So we need to do something as a continent to grow the food that we eat and to be able to export to the rest of the world. A larger issue on our agricultural production has to deal with question of productivity. South Africa, is doing better than the rest of the continent six times in mm -hmm. terms of productivity. If only we can replicate the production method in South Africa to the rest of the African countries, without increasing the land order cultivation, we'll be able to more than three times increase our productivity. And that will then be sufficient, because we're not going to talk about 
one year, it could take two, three, but we shouldn't be hungry for a long time in the presence of opportunity to be able to change the course of history. And as a bank, what are we doing is having this conversation with people that we can actually invest in agriculture. Sometimes it, we don't have problem with food production, but we have post-harvest losses that private sector can participate in in making sure that those post-harvest losses are reduced. We need to be able to transport the food from where the food is produced to where the food is consumed. Remember, a large number of our cities are where people, uh, uh, people are, and where the food is produced is much uh, larger way. We cannot continue to fight wars mm. in the continent. I expect that food will be coming from where the wars are being fought, and it can't get to where the food needs to be consumed. We can continue to have the bread basket of Africa be mined because people are fighting wars over something that even they themselves cannot remember now why South Sudan is fighting war. They can't remember themselves. So it is important that we come together, understand the imperative of being able to feed ourselves, and stop relying on importing wheat mm. from Ukraine when we have more land, multiple land than Ukraine to be able to produce wheat. We need to get that done ourselves. And we are then inviting our partners, people in the room, to come and invest in some of the areas in agricultural value chain where we believe that you can get good return on your investment. And our governments in Africa has to then make that, uh, in terms of investment, has to then make sure that investors are welcome. What? So that when they invest, and they generate profit because ultimately everybody is looking for investment to be able to generate returns. And those returns have to be good to give better return on investment because we are competing with the rest of the world. And when they get that return, they should be able to uh, repatriate the return back to their, to their home countries. I mean, this issue of Africa having more arable land than any other continent um, in the world. Uncultivated. It, uncultivated, but arable, right? Yeah. Um, and if you look at a, a, a proper map of the world, and the, the real size of Africa as opposed to sort of the reduced size in a lot of atlases, you see, you, you see the truth of that. But having said that, um, the level of investment in agriculture in Africa has fallen way short of, uh, of, of the potential in the short term, let alone the longer term. I mean, I know there are some ambitious economists on, on, in the continent, places like the African Development Bank, talking about Africa actually becoming, uh, turning the tables completely and becoming a net food exporter to the rest of the world, particularly in the Middle East, for example. What is getting in the way of that? I mean, it's obviously okay. lack, of, lack of capital, but why isn't the capital coming? What more can the financial institutions like your own do to change that process? It's not been lack of capital, it's lack of imagination by mm -hmm. us, by the way. It's not, uh, the rest of the world don't owe us food to eat, right? Sure. It's lack yeah. of imagination by ourselves. We allocate as Ecobank almost $2 billion of our own capital right. for the purpose of supporting production of agriculture. Yeah. Some of them are cash crops, some of them are food crops, but you need other crops to be produced yeah. so that the farmers can be, can be wealthy themselves. We need to stop subsidizing food import to enable production of food in the continent to happen. If you look at the part of the problems of wheat mm. now, is that the wheat that is coming from Ukraine is subsidized by our countries, instead of using that subsidy money to actually invest in, in agriculture. Right. We need to do those things, and the banks are allocating capital. Yeah. But our Problem, there's some certain uh, structural issues that need to get resolved, whether it's land tenure, land holding. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to uh, finance ministers or agricultural ministers, and they said, listen, are they, you, uh, we want you to invest in agriculture. I said, yeah, of course we want to invest mm -hmm. in agriculture. I want to lend money because I want to eat as well. But can you tell me, the land these small-scale farmers have, do they do they have title to those lands? Because if you don't have title to the land, it means I can only lend you money for one crop. Right. And if that crop fails, mm. okay, the money is lost. Right. Whereas if you own the land, or you have title to the land for a longer period, 
Yeah. Then I can lend you money. If one crop fails, we'll wait for next year. And we'll be able to get the money back. So some of those things we need to do. And honestly, I listen to everybody. We need to stop talking one country, this country, mm. that country. We need to be looking at the continent. But take it, okay, fine, agree. Look, look at the continent. But is there any one country at the moment you think that's really got it right on agriculture or group of countries where you're saying the production is booming? South Africa production is better than the rest of us. It's six really? times better than the rest of us. Really? Okay, than the rest of the other, other countries. Uh, yeah, that is the country that has gotten it right. Ethiopia right. is making good progress in terms of the wheat production. Right. The uh, West African countries are making mm. progress in terms of rice production. We just need to right. accelerate that. Right. So you're on the right trajectory. Um, when, it, when it comes to getting the money to, to, to fuel business, what is the role of an institution like yours? Because, uh, you know, we hear this argument of you've got it all wrong. You know, banks don't actually lend money to businesses in Africa. That, that's, these are the family funds, these are the capital market funds. The banks just lend you operating money. So actually the, the level of interest rates in a, in a country isn't really the determinant of, of, of the viability of a business. Okay. Uh, so can you fit us in so, with okay. where, where the, how so it works? As banks, we are always, we wake up every day yeah. uh, trying to find businesses we can lend to. Right. So we do that. Right. I run a bank. We have a balance sheet of uh, close to $27 billion, and we lend in multiple countries in Africa, 33 countries, yeah. including the countries that you never fly to, Central Africa, that is fighting war. We have businesses there, and we continue to, to do that. So we do, we do our bit. Right. But we have to get to understand that financial capital allocation goes beyond loans. Right. When you have an idea in a developed world, you have not generated any income. Right. But you want, you have an idea, the idea is good. You go to angel investor. From there, you go to venture capitalist. Yeah. From there, you go to private equity. From there, you have capital market for which you go out. In all of this, we are talking equity. Mm. A venture capitalist allo uh, allocation of capital is different from a bank lending allocation of capital. Right. A venture capitalist will say, listen, only one in four will survive. And that one that survives in four is sufficient to give me a good return. Mm. A banker cannot say one in four will fail. Mm. Because if one in four fails, that bank is dead. Yeah. So we need to start having proper conversation about the sources of capital and the uses of capital and the type of capital. If a bank is lending and one in four fails, remember, a bank is an institution that holds in its custody the resources of people that are working so that when they can no longer work and they come to me, they will be able to get their money back. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is money in custody. But when it comes to capital, we need to do much more. And our countries now need to start thinking about people's savings and investment, allocation of pension money for the purpose of unlocking some of these issues that we have. And of course, banks will allocate sufficient money in terms of uh, loan to be able to get that job done. But a bank cannot operate like a venture capitalist. Mm. A venture capitalist is prepared for one, only one in four to pass. Right. A bank that does that, that bank will not survive. The, the other issue I wanted to touch on uh, before we close, um, we started talking about the financial, global financial crisis at the moment. In terms of the pressure on exchange rates, and I know, you, you know you're located in the, the safer zone, so you've got a particularly strong position on that one, uh, but also on interest rates and, and, and debt, the cost of debt servicing. How are you as an institution navigating those issues right now? Okay, from our point of view, the price of money is driven by inflation. Mm. Okay? And most times, inflation is as consequence of supply of money. Yeah. If our government print money, mm. run deficit, inflation will catch up. Yeah. Okay, let's be clear about that. Mm -hmm. If our people are not ready to pay taxes and they want everything to be subsidized, there will be inflation. 
So we need to deal with inflation mm. truthfully, okay? Mm. Not in podium and having these conversations about government can provide everything for you free and the people who don't have to pay taxes right. and some, some way magically, mana will form from heaven and the economy will be straight. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. And people need to competently speak truth to mm -hmm. their population. If you don't pay taxes, you will pay inflation. Yeah. Pretty simple. And look at all the countries around us, you don't pay taxes, you want subsidy, you pay in inflation. Mm. So our leaders, together with all of us, and some of us in this room that are from the continent, have to be able to speak truth to power. And whenever I have the opportunity, mm. most people don't listen, but I, <laughs> we are. But, but, but I, but I say that, if you don't pay taxes, mm. and you want the government to do something, mm. then they have to inflate. Yeah. If they inflate, your interest rate will be high. Let's not blame the interest rate for the problem. Let's blame the root cause, inflation, because we don't pay taxes and we want everything subsidized. Right. If we have to have that conversation and we we'll reverse that, and then we'll be able to take that forward. And you see, if you look at countries where the money supply is not uh, getting out of hand, I live in Togo, right. inflation is two, three percent, mm. and interest rate is in single digit. Mm. In Bene, inflation is 2-3%, interest rate is single digit. The government of Bene Republic get money from outside world at 6 What about to the east of Benin, that big place there? East of Benin, where is east of Benin? That's Nigeria. <laughs> so, you see, again, it goes there. It, go and look at the tax to GDP in Nigeria. 7%? Okay, go and or look, no, no, go and look at the price per liter of petrol in Nigeria, mm. okay? And then compare that with the neighboring country and the rest of the world. And mm. then you can do that maths. You do know maths more than me. No, it, for the extent, And that is why, I mean, we have to, we mm. can blame Ukraine for, until the cows come home. But before Ukraine, we had those inflation. And all of us, responsibly, have to speak truth to our people that you cannot subsidize everything you cannot refuse to pay taxes, but you expect your government to do everything. It's not possible. I think there were some conversations a bit like that going on in Downing Street a few weeks back. So I'm an African. I don't uh, <laughs> insult my host. <laughs> I'm not asking you to. <laughs> OK, thank, thanks so much for the advice. And uh, may you continue to speak truth to power wherever you find it. Thank you very much, uh, Adi. Thank you.